This is going to be our fourth and final lecture for Module 1. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about tunnels and manholes as applicable to Article 110. Our objectives for this le lesson, we're going to identify the NEC requirements for tunnels containing electrical equipment, identify NEC requirements for cabling, working space, and manholes, uh, list requirements for manholes size and covers, and list location for wire bending space for 1,000 volts or less and over uh, 1,000 volts. So this this lesson, this uh, lecture is going to be a little bit hit on a couple different subjects and topics. Not really a whole lot of information about any specific thing, but a variety of topics. <coughs> so definition, we have the actual definition of a manhole here and the actual definition of a tunnel as well. Um, and also dedicated, once again, as per the last lecture. So starting off here at Article 110, uh, should be Part 5, uh, tunnel installations over 1,000 volts nominal. Or sorry, we actually will be starting at Part 4, tunnel installations over 1,000 volts. Uh, and we'll be going into Part 5 as well. Uh, this is going to be starting on page 52 of your 2017 edition of your NEC. So part, part four applies to the installation and use of high voltage power distribution equipment that is portable, mobile, or both. It's going to be the scope of part four. Conductors must be placed above the tunnel floor and protected from physical damage. So this is going to be uh, specifically for installations in tunnels. We're saying we can't lay the conductors directly on the floor of the tunnel. We have to be elevated or suspended above the floor, and they have to be protected from physical damage by some means. High voltage conductors, so this meaning over a thousand volts, must be installed in middle conduit or raceway, must be type MC cable or other approved multi-conductor uh, cable. Um, so any of those three options can be either conductors run in middle conduit, MC cable, or some other type of approved multi-conductor cable. <coughs> so this is going to be some examples of the kind of tunnels we're talking about here. Uh, on the left, you can see more of an industrial type tunnel, and we can see some cable tray right at the top of the tunnel. We can see some light fixtures on the right-hand side. And then on the right picture, we can see this is more of a traffic through fair tunnel. Uh, we have a lot of lighting in this tunnel. We can see conduit run on the right-hand side there. <coughs> so sticking with tunnels, we're going to be talking about bonding and equipment grounding conductors. Um, you may or may not be familiar with bonding conductors or equipment grounding conductors at this point. Uh, we'll be talking about those in Module 2. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you don't currently have any knowledge about those, uh, after you get through Module 2 and you have a, a, ver a very strong understanding of them, maybe go back and refresh yourself on this, this part of this lecture. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and talk about it now since that is included with Article 110. Um, so all non-current carrying metal parts of equipment, metal raceways, and cable sheaths must be grounded and bonded to all metal pipes and rails at the portal, portal being kind of the entrance to the tunnel, and at intervals not exceeding a thousand feet. Um, so in other words, <coughs> if it's a non-current carrying piece of electrical equipment, whether it be the equipment itself or metallic raceway or cable sheath, we have to bond it to essentially everything else uh, metallic in that tunnel at the entrance and every thousand feet after that. And an equipment grounding conductor must be run inside metal raceways or inside multi-conductor cable jackets, and that equipment grounding conductor may be insulated or bare. So as we'll learn in Module 2 when we're talking about equipment gr grounding conductors, um, metallic raceway and some multi-conductor metallic multi-conductor cable sheaths can actually be used as an equipment grounding conductor. However, we're installed in a tunnel um, they cannot be. We have to run an additional equipment grounding conductor within them. <coughs> Moving on from there, we're going to be talking about disconnecting means and enclosures. Uh, once again, as they pertain to tunnels, uh, a switch or circuit breaker 
that opens all ungrounded conductors must be installed within sight of each transformer or motor. So specifically for transformers and mo motors where we have those installed in a tunnel, we have to supply them uh, with a disconnect switch uh, with inside of them. Meaning if you're at the transformer you sh or the motor, you should be able to see the disconnect switch while standing uh, directly in front of it. And the disconnect switch must have an ampere rating not less than the transformer supply conductors. <coughs> Enclosures must be drip proof, weather proof, or submersible as required by the environment. So we would use one t table 110.28 as we talked about in our last lecture to select some enclosure type that meets these requirements. Switch and contactor enclosures cannot be used as junction boxes or raceways for other switch conductors unless the enclosure complies with 312.8. So that's kind of a odd note to include with the first half of this 110.59, but it is there so to make a quick mention of it. So that concludes part four of uh, this lecture. Now we're going to be moving on to part five and we're going to have a little bit more information in part five than we did part four. <coughs> kind of why my mind wanted to just default to part five. Uh, so part five is going to talk about manholes and other electrical enclosures intended for personnel entry. In other words, you can enter it some which way. Enclosures intended for personnel Personnel entry must be of sufficient size to provide safe workspace about the equipment with live parts that is likely to require service while energized. In other words, if you can get inside of it, you need enough space inside of it to safely work on the equipment. Must be of sufficient size to install or remove conductors without damaging them, kind of a common sense rule there. And manholes, vaults, and their means of access must be designed under qualified engineering supervision. In other words, we cannot <coughs> field design these and create them. It's one of the rare instances where the NEC actually require, specifically requires engineering supervision in order to do something. Um, the NEC will a lot of times give exceptions or alternate installation methods when you have engineering supervision, uh, but very rarely uh, will you only have one way of doing something that requires engineering supervision? But we see that here with 110.71. These are going to be some examples of manholes uh, that we have. On the left-hand side here, we can see one that's uh, been formed up a little bit more. We already have conduits uh, entering it. And then on the right-hand side here, we get a little bit more. Uh, a, we get a little bit more of an aerial view down into the manhole. And also, this is before... Uh, conduits have entered it. Sticking with manholes, we're going to be talking about the cable and equipment working space within those manholes. Uh, our last slide about them kind of talked about entering and egressing them is what you could boil that down to. Now we're going to talk about uh, stuff actually located inside of them. <coughs> so where cables are located on both sides of the enclosure. So if we think back to the terminology we had when talking about the depth of working space, we're kind of using that same terminology here for cables. So where cables are located on both sides of the enclosure. A working space of not less than three feet must be, be provided, and where the cables are only on one side, a working space of two and a half feet must be provided. So we're always going to need some type of working space inside of a manhole, as we previously mentioned, in order to safely work while inside of the manhole. And this kind of defines for us what those dimensions have to be. The vertical headroom shall not be less than six feet unless the opening is within one feet of the adjacent interior sidewall of the enclosure. Uh, so the, the wording of that can be uh, just a little bit, uh, is a little bit awkward, not really well worded. <coughs> What this is basically telling us is the where that working space for the cables needs to be provided, it has to be at least six feet in height unless the opening to the manhole is within one feet on the adjacent wall of that working space. And equipment with live parts that are likely to require service must meet the requirements of 110.26 uh, 
where 1,000 volts or less, and 110.34, where over 1,000 volts. So this is going to be pointing us back to our working space requirements. And a manhole cover that weighs over 100 pounds fulfills the requirements of 110.34C. So this is just kind of an odd little tag-along note included with 110.73 here about the cover. Uh, there are some specific requirements for manhole covers and so on and so forth in terms of their shape, size, and we'll be looking at those here in our next couple slides. Uh, so we talked about this now, the specific requirements for the conductors once they're in the manhole, about working space around them. Now we're gonna back up from there just a little bit and talk about actually installing them, some of the installation requirements we have. Uh, conductors must be cabled, racked up, or arranged in an approved manner must also comply with 110.74 A or B. <clears throat> so looking at those, 110.74 A is for 1,000 volts or less, wire bending space must comply with 314.28, and for 110.74 B, which is over 1,000 volts, the wire bending space must comply with 314.71 A and B. Um, so this is all pretty self-explanatory there. First part of 110.74 tells us we have to have these uh, cables supported or racked as they call it in some which way, meaning we can't just throw our conductors down on the ground of the manhole uh, and call that good. Um, and then it also points us towards the wire bending space for the cables, depending the conductors and the cables. Uh, this applies to both cables and conductors. The wire bending space for those dependent on if they are a thousand volts or less or over a thousand volts. Um, sticking with manhole steel, once again we're still in part five so pretty much everything we're talking about here is going to be for manholes. Uh, we're going to talk about the required access to them. So we've talked about once you're inside of it, the working space for it. We've talked about how the equipment has to be and the conductors have to be installed within the manhole. We're gonna back up again from there and talk about the access to the manhole, so how you actually get into it and some of the specific requirements for the cover uh, of the manhole. So how we're going to close that up once we have everything installed and done. Uh, rectangular openings cannot be less than 26 inches by 22 inches and round openings cannot be less than 26 inches in diameter. Uh, so as I'd mentioned, we have some pretty specific requirements for our covers for manholes. So you can see depending on uh, which kind of cover it is, whether it's a rectangular opening or a round opening, <coughs> we have some different sizing requirements here. Uh, covers must weigh over 100 pounds or require tools to open. So if they do require tools to open, they don't have to meet the 100 pound rule. Uh, but if you can just walk up to it and pick it up, it needs to be over 100 pounds. Uh, the purpose of this is it's really just to deter people from walking up to a manhole and just opening it up uh, for no particular reason or for unqualified or untrained people to open up these manholes. Uh, it's kind of to deter that. You know, if we think about a cover that weighs over 100 pounds, if you just walk up to it, it's going to be very heavy for most people. Uh, so you're not really going to be as enticed to open it just to see what's inside of it. Um, and if it requires tools, kind of the same situation, you're probably just not, you're probably not just walking around with a tool bag on you at all times to open up random manhole covers. Um, however, if you're a trained and qualified person and you have a reason to open up that manhole, you're going to know uh, kind of what you're getting into when you do go to open it. And then additionally, the manhole covers must not be capable of falling into the manhole. <coughs> so that's kind of part of the sizing requirements we have above, why they have to be sized in such a way, is so that once we get the cover off the manhole, we don't want to be able to just drop it down into it or to be able to drop it into it accidentally while trying to remove it. Uh, and the covers must be marked to indicate their function. So in other words, you don't just have a random cover for something uh, right on grade that you don't know what is. It has to indicate, you know, electrical manhole or something to that effect. 
And that is going to wrap up this lecture covering uh, parts four and five of Article 110, and that's also going to be our last lecture for Module 1. Uh, so our next lecture is going to be start of Module 2. We're going to be taking a look at grounding conduct grounded conductors.